We need to talk about federalism. You see, the United States of America in many ways is not one country, but 50. The clue is in the name, the United States of America. And I've, I've put this kind of picture here of one glorious country with the American flag, but I easily also could have chosen one of those ones that shows you all the different states and gone, well, actually, it, it's many, many different countries. Because let's look at the definition of federalism. A theory of government that divides political power between the national and state governments. Each has their own area of jurisdiction. The idea being that we have a national, that's a federal government with its own president, its own Congress, its own judiciary, which are the famous ones you know, and they are responsible for certain things in America, national issues if you like, but then each individual state has its own area of jurisdiction and this is laid down by the constitution there is a clear divide so perhaps in the same way that you have a two-tier legal system in america perhaps there's also a two-tier governmental system of this federal and this state system together this is what's known as federalism and in this video we're going to be looking at how that relationship has changed and modified um, and whether it matters and what effect it has um, over the years. As always, after you've watched this video, there is some further reading you can do. Uh, of course, you can check out in the revision guide for some basics, or you can go into the far more challenging this time, uh, US government and politics pages uh, 36 to 46. And I've got an awesome link here that tells you a bit about some of the, uh, the stories that go behind federalism that's well worth your time. And uh, either copy it out or link is in the description, and um, you can do some further reading there. So, I just want to kind of set the scene here a little bit because we you've probably come across when looking at UK politics the idea of a unitary uh, system or unitary uh, constitution and the idea of a federal constitution. You've also come across the idea of um, parliamentary sovereignty and constitutional sovereignty and federal sovereignty and, 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 and things like that. Now, just think about this. Unitary structure... Great Britain, as in us, United Kingdom, the idea that Parliament is sovereign, all power ultimately rests in that one place, versus a federal structure, which these countries have, including America, where you have power residing in multiple places, really, both in the federal government and in the state government. But look at the third option, a confederate structure. Now, America tried this in 1787, and it failed completely. But imagine, look a bit further down the list. Think about the European Union. The European Union, in many ways, is, is a confederacy. It's a group of separate countries that, for their own purposes, have decided to join together in certain ways, voluntarily, and agree in some way to be governed. But the bonds are, the bonds are loose, if you like. And imagine if suddenly the European Union started handing out directive after directive and interfering in all sorts of areas of British life. What would the reaction of Britain or other countries be? Some wouldn't mind at all. Others would feel that their own independence has been attacked and threatened and would want to take back control. You can see where I'm going with this with a Brexit analogy. But my point is, is that this federal system that America has is, 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 can be seen as a big threat to some people living in certain states. Some people very much dislike the federal government and very much see themselves more akin to the European Union. So some people that say live in Texas might enjoy the freedoms they enjoy in Texas and like the, the Texas government, but actually very much dislike being told what to do by the federal structure. Think about some of the uh, rebellions that they were against Obamacare, uh, which we'll be talking about a bit later in the video. But imagine like something like Obamacare coming from the EU. Imagine what kind of division that would cause within the UK with some people being very much for it and other people claiming, well, who are you, the European Union, to tell us what to do in our country? So keep that in mind as we go through talking about the federal system, that for some people it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, passionate, um, integral part of, of, of American life, and for other people, less so. It's, it's an irritation having this federal government. Perhaps these would have been the people that would have been the, uh, the, the anti-federates, um, the anti-federal campaigners um, back when America was first being put together. So. In a previous video, we've been talking about uh, enumerated powers, that's powers that are exclusive to the federal government, concurrent powers, which is powers that both have, uh, or they share, 
and exclusive state powers, which are often known as the reserved powers, thanks to um, Article 10. So let's, let's have a look at a few highlights. So the federal government is what's able to coin money. So for example, you don't have the, uh, the, the dollar of Massachusetts and the, uh, the New York dime or whatever like that. It, it's federal, it's done nationally. There's one monetary uh, currency um, in America. Uh, it's also uh, the federal government that will declare war. So, so Florida can't declare war on the UK and the rest of America goes, what? what's going on there? Um, foreign affairs. And then we've got things uh, such as um, doing the mail to make sure they can kind of post things around. So if, when you think about it, these all make sense. These are, these are kind of national issues that the federal government has, deals with by itself. And then in the concurrent, you've got things that remember both the state and the national government can do. So things like taxes. So the federal government raises taxes for armies and then the local government, the, the state government, will raise taxes for its local things, such as, such as health. Um, and you can see through um, the list there the other options. We can also then go to the state powers, the reserve powers. Well, they conduct elections in whatever way they want. They establish local governments in whatever way they want. They have health, they have wealth care, often education. They can ratify constitutional amendments, etc., etc., etc. So here is a clear list of how the powers are split up in the Constitution. Now, in theory, this should be the end of the video. This should be like, here we go, this is federalism, enumerated powers, concurrent powers, Reserve powers, jobs done. But the truth is, this power, these powers, this relationship is not static. It is not static. It has changed. It is evolving. Sometimes the federal government gets stronger. It takes on more powers. Sometimes it gets weaker. The powers appear to go back to the states. And as we go through this video, you're going to be seeing how this relationship has changed, how the powers have changed, and arguably, therefore, how the Constitution has changed as this list of um, roles or this list of powers merges, changes, twists, um, over time. And the debate that come, they come back to again and again is, does the federal government have the right to do that, whatever it might be, or not? Does the federal government have that? So let's talk a little, about, a little bit about um, the evolving um, relationships. And I'm going to bring this up one at a time. I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the individual wording of the Constitution um, in these videos, but um, I think this one um, does deserve it. Now, remember the elastic clause. Can you remember that from the previous video? It's, it's often known as the necessary and proper clause. It's the one that kind of keeps expanding it. Let's, let's have a little look at the wording of this. This is the elastic clause, necessary and proper. The federal government has the power to, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So the the, the, the federal government has the power to make all laws which are necessary and proper to carry out its powers. What does that mean? It's very vague. It's expandable. Well, because I have the power to do this, I therefore need the power to do this. Oh, because I need the power to do this, I also need the power to do this. It keeps growing and growing. It keeps stretching and stretching. And when this was written into the original constitution, you can imagine the states being pretty nervous about this particular clause. Obviously, it wasn't known as the elastic clause back then. But because it is vague, remember, the Constitution has, is specific and vague. Because it's vague and because it has this potential to grow, you can see, you can sense the nervousness of the states here feeling, oh, I'm not so sure we're kind of happy about this. We need something to kind of protect our powers. So when the Bill of Rights comes along, uh, uh, which is the first 10 amendments, which I talked about in a previous video. Number 10, there you go, numeral X, um, specifies the reserved powers. Or so rather, it doesn't specify what the reserved powers are, but it specifies that they are there. So it says, the powers that are not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or the people. Let's put it in slightly single, simpler language. The powers that are not given to the federal government belong to the states or the people. There you go, there's, there's your simple version. And it's putting there in black and white, or in this case kind of yellow and white, it's putting there and saying, if it doesn't say that it's specifically that it's a federal government power, then it ain't. 
a federal government power. So they're trying here to, 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 to put into the Constitution a clarity that actually most things belong to the states. And this is important for Americans. Think about the, the ideas behind freedom and getting away from tyranny, you know, the idea that, that, that they are not controlled by a king, a dictator, a, a, a faceless government from elsewhere is very important to them. In American history, one of the big slogan, slogans was uh, no taxation without representation because they were so angry that they had no representation in the English parliament. They want to be, in many cases, completely free, but failing free, they want to be governed at home. And obviously, yes, I'm generalizing, I'm stereotyping, not every American will be there, but there is um, a, a, a movement in that direction that would be perhaps foreign to uh, the kind of the English culture. But then things change again. We have the American Civil War and this time the, the federal government under Abraham Lincoln comes along and says, we're gonna abolish slavery and it leads to war. And the Southern states don't want to abolish slavery, the Northern states do in general. The war happens, the Southern states lose and the federal government imposes amendment 13, which says we're now gonna abolish slavery. How about that? look it up if you want. But they also add in amendment 14 because they're concerned that what the Southern states will do is that they'll abolish slavery, but then these slaves won't actually be given any rights after that. So this amendment, uh, amendment 14 is trying to protect these new citizens rights if you like let's have a little look it says all persons born or naturalized in the united states which would have included the slaves and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the united states so if you were a slave and you're born in the united states all of a sudden you are now a citizen of the united states you can see how this is going to upset the southern states because it's telling them who's the citizens and who's not Carry on down. And of the state wherein they reside, no state, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. So no state can take away the rights of any of its citizens. And that's being imposed by the federal government. Keep going down. Nor shall the state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So in the Constitution, it is saying to every single state that every single person that's born there must be a citizen. They must be, uh, they cannot have any of their privileges taken away and they must have equal protection under the laws. Now, this amendment has been used in debates about abortion, debates about homosexuality, debates about marriage, debates about equal rights and voting, and, and, all, and uh, of course, whether that's voting for black people or voting for women. You know, this amendment has been a big deal because whenever a state has wanted to pull in a different direction, the federal government has been able to say, uh, 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 you can't do this because um, all state, no state can make or enforce any law that, that abridges the privileges. Um, so you can see the relationship evolve across these three ideas. The elastic clause has the potential to expand. The Amendment 10 says, slams it back and says, hang on, no, our states have um, our own rights. And then Amendment 14 comes along and, and really puts quite a big wedge in there saying, or on restrictions on how the states can treat its own citizens, which does take away a huge amount of the individual freedoms um, of those states. So we know now that it changes over time. We know, we know now that the federal government over time has kind of taken on more powers, but let's put a few ex ex concrete examples in there that you can write about in your exams and that you can show how you, un you understood how this relationship how the federal government gets bigger and then maybe smaller and then maybe bigger again. We can basically kind of put American federalism into a few distinct phases. First of all, we've got kind of the pre-1920. And I've put a picture of Abraham Lincoln there because he lived before 1920. Um, and I've already mentioned him in terms of slavery and things like that. But before 1920, by and large, states have a lot of freedom to make their own uh, rules and regulations. Yes, there are obvious exception, exceptions, such as the slavery, such as um, votes for women and things like that. But more or less, the states are given as much freedom as possible within those restrictions. But then something happens, and most of the things that we all see in this phase are caused by um, 
events, whether they're world events, whether they're national events. But we have something which has become known as the Wall Street crash. And the American economy absolutely tanks. Of course, there's a world war going on in uh, Europe as well. We're kind of talking around the kind of 1918, going into the kind of 1930s. And America's in serious financial trouble. In fact, the, the world is really. And this guy here, FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, comes along and he says, right, vote for the New Deal, people. I am going to sort out America. I am going to take care of this. Um, not, in a, not in a Donald Trump, like only I can save America, but he comes in with a plan, with a new deal. And this new deal involves taking on a huge amount of new federal powers. He uses that elastic clause to say, right, I'm going to need to do everything that's necessary and proper to sort out the economy, which means I'm going to start telling the federal, I'm going to start telling the individual states what to do. He starts uh, raising taxes. He starts putting in stimulus packages. He starts um, forcing the states to uh, change its kind of economic policies in the name of sorting out the American um, economy. He starts putting in uh, building of new infrastructure, creating new jobs and all this kind of stuff. And by and large, it works. This is this is pretty much known as a good period of American history where America kind of sold its economic pro uh, uh, problems. But in the process, the federal government just explodes in terms of its size, explodes in terms of its terms of its responsibilities and the powers which it now has. And while you go through World War I and World War II, which is really the first time America had fought wars external to itself, the federal government gets bigger and bigger, whether it's commanding its forces, whether it's dealing with the economy, whether it's, you know, look at the textbooks for kind of more example, but the, the federal government is getting bigger and bigger from this kind of 1920s towards the 1960s and 70s era. But eventually, this, as history normally goes, it, the, 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 the needle swings one way and swings back the other. And eventually some politicians start to come in and say, no, 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 the federal government is doing way too much. It perhaps starts with Nixon, maybe goes through Gerald Ford, but perhaps most famously Ronald Reagan, president in the 1980s. He says things like, uh, people ask me what, uh, uh, what, what government is going to do about the problem. And I say to them, government is the problem. Now, he's mainly talking economically there, but he really tried to shrink the government down and get the government less involved, less red tape, less regulations, um, less um, bureaus and departments and, and, and things like that. And it, it was really one of his rallying calls was this idea of small government and liberty and freedom. And now hopefully you've studied, um, excuse me. And now hopefully, hopefully you've studied um, neoliberalism and different forms of liberalism and capitalism, you'll know that there is a big strong, there was a big movement in the 1980s for small government to not interfere, lower taxes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you've got low taxes, that means you've got small government, because if there's not very many taxes, then the government can't afford to do much. So it doesn't do much. And then there's a lot more freedom for people to do their own thing. So we've seen the federal government grow. We've seen the New Deal expand its powers, and then we've seen a kind of a movement against it come along in the, the 70s and 80s. But then we go back the other way. George Bush 53. This is, uh, this is not George Bush Sr. This is George Bush Jr., the one that was famous for going to war with uh, Tony Blair in Iraq and, um, and other things like that. Now, he's a Republican, so you would expect him to be roughly in line with... Um, Ronald Reagan, same political party. But in reality, he wasn't. In reality, um, although I'm sure they agreed about certain things, in reality, he actually expanded the powers of the federal government quite a lot, especially in regards to education and in regards to Medicaid. Now, he had a famous uh, set of policies that became known as No Child Left Behind, where the federal government imposed a load of tests on children across the country, like think, think um, like SATs and things like that. He wanted to standardize tests across the country so he could try and help levels of literacy and ensure that no child was left behind. Now, this is, doesn't sound particularly controversial, perhaps in the UK, but in the US, this was a big deal that the federal government was getting involved in national educational issues. Um, 
he also gets involved in Medicaid, which I mentioned, which is to do with um, helping pensioners and providing health care and prescriptions for um, pensioners and things like that. So he expands the role of the federal government into these into these new areas. It was controversial. Some Republicans, his own party, voted against this um, in the uh, in, in Congress, but it did get through. Then Obama comes along. Now Obamacare huge changes to the health service in America. And this comes from the federal government and it is pushed out across the states that every American must have the ability to be able to be insured. And if you, if you aren't aware how controversial this was, then you need to kind of do some research and find some programs on it. But some people love it, but many people hated it. And some people even said, this is the end of federalism. This is the end of the independence of, of these states. This is how much they hated it. They felt that this was, this was like the EU basically swallowing up all of the other countries and taking their control away because they argued that it was a tax and that they were being forced to um, merge together and pay for each other's health care and things like that. And, and you can decide for yourself if it's an overreaction or, or whatever. I mean, that's not what I'm here to judge. But my point is, is that he expanded the federal government even more into the world of healthcare. He also tried to change um, the policies in regards to immigration. There's something known as DACA and I've forgotten the other one, it's DA something, but it's to do with allowing um, children of immigrants to claim citizenship. Um, now, both of these uh, were challenged uh, constitutionally, you know, Obama was taken to court and the Supreme Court had to make a decision in, in each case whether they were going to block Obamacare or allow Obamacare or block DACA and allow DACA. And in the case of the, the, the DACA, the, 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 the children of immigration, um, they, they did, they did block him. They, they did kind of get in the way. But over these phases, you can see that the federal government gets bigger, which is perhaps another reason why you get movements like the Tea Party movement. Uh, which we will come back to and discuss in the future, but a, a very strong element of American politics that again want to go back to small government. So when Donald Trump says, make America great again, in many ways, what people hear is small government and a, a smaller federal um, influence on their lives. So these are the phases that federalism has gone to. And there's a really nice summary of some of the recent uh, changes, especially from Bush 53 and Obama. If you look at page 44 to 45 of your US politics textbook, I would strongly recommend reading there because it gives you some very clear examples from Bush 53 and Obama. But hopefully I've given you a kind of an overall understanding of it. To finish this video, I would just like to say, so what? Federalism, so what? What, what difference does it actually make? To Americans' lives, or, or, or how does being a federal country make them different to being a country like ours, where it has a kind of unitary system? So this is the, the final thoughts I'd like you to leave you with. Like, I'd like you to leave you with. So you can see them there, but let's let's go through them one by one if I can get the PowerPoint working. First of all, because they are a federal system, they do have different laws from state to state. A very clear example I'm sure you're all aware of is the death penalty is allowed in certain states and not others. Cannabis is allowed in certain states and not others. They have different ages where you can drink, I think, different ages to marry. Um, the laws are different from state to state. If you drive between Scotland and England, the law doesn't change. There are differences in terms of policy differences, in terms of education and things, but the law itself does not change. Policy differences between different states. I've given the example here of the environment. Different, different states have very different attitudes towards environmental protections, towards immigration, towards taxation. There are certain states that have very high taxes. There are certain states that have very low taxes. They keep them low because they want people to kind of move there. This is a big impact of having a federal system. They can, they can actually run their elections, their primary elections, their presidential elections, their congressional elections, etc., etc., in whatever way you want. Now, when we start looking at the electoral electoral college, you'll discover that many states are winner take all states, but other states have changed the system to kind of split their kind of votes up. If you're not, if you don't understand what I'm talking about yet, but don't worry. But just understand that they actually, it, it would be a bit like Gerard's Cross electing their MP in a different way to how Watford elects their MP. Okay, it's that kind of idea of having different systems for elections in different places. 
It also has a big impact on the parties. And I've given you an unusual example here of the Texas Democratic Party. Now, think about it. In the Republic, Texas is going to be a very Republican area. So Democrats that live in Texas are actually going to be a lot more to the right than, say, a Democrat that lives in New York, for example. And my point here is to say that actually different states have different parties. The Democrat Party in Texas is not the same party, really, as the Democrat Party in um, New York in regards to the policies they have or the way they do their little local elections or campaigns or, or things like that. There is not a unified presence in the same way that we might recognize in the UK. Huge tax variations between um, the different states, which I think I mentioned here in regards to kind of policy differences. But yeah, they're, they're, some of them have high taxes, some have low taxes, some tax um, in different ways. Um, and that, that gets on top of the federal government as well. And of course, massive cultural differences between the states. There's an area of the America known as the Bible Belt, the religious states. There's an, America, there's an area of America known as the Rust Belt, which is kind of all the kind of industrial states or the old industrial states that Donald Trump very much targeted. You've got the liberal um, areas. You've got New York, you've got Florida, you've got California. In many ways, these states are as different from each other culturally as perhaps um, Great Britain is from Italy or, or Greece. America is a colossal country and the, by having a federal system, it allows these different cultures, these different national prides, for want of a better word, um, to flourish and to kind of be enhanced, which is why many people see themselves as Texan first and maybe American second. That might be an exaggeration, but, but go with the point for a little bit that, that, that there are very, very different cultures across America in a way that we don't really see in the UK, mainly because the, the country is just so big. So is federalism actually any good? Why does it actually help America? Well, it allows them to be diverse. It means there's a lot more access points, meaning uh, you could, you've got a local government, you've got state government, you've got federal government. There's lots of different places you can go to with problems or, or vote for. Um, in theory, it protects your liberty because you've got the different representatives looking out for you. And it's well suited to the USA. The USA is such a big, big country that a federal system seems to suit it. Over here, we have devolution, which seems to kind of more suit us, or certainly at the moment, and it has lasted. Unlike the original Confederacy, which is a bit like a kind of an American EU, which fell apart, this federal system, as I disappear into the green, um, this federal system has lasted and perhaps has allowed America to become a huge power by binding these states together, but not too tightly. So what are the weaknesses? Uh, these all begin with C. It is complex. The system is complex about exactly who has responsibility for what power. It does lead to conflict with states taking the federal government to court and, 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 and vice versa and citizens' rights getting kind of lost in the mix. It is costly because lots of things are, are duplicated at both a federal and a state level. Um, and it does create inequality across America. If you come, come from a certain demographic, albeit, um, say, to do your sexuality or, or your race, then you may well have experienced very different laws, policies, attitudes across different states in America. It's a fascinating system with a fascinating history. And hopefully this video has given you kind of an overview of how this relationship between the national and the, the local has evolved and changed over time. So now it's time for you to do your own reading, your own research, get some good examples, form some opinions on, on what you think the, the, perhaps the federal government should be and we'll talk about it more in class. Thanks for watching. If you've got any good examples I could have used or should have used, stick them in the comments. If I've made any mistakes, let me know. And if you liked it, then don't forget to like it. See you soon.